Okay, welcome everyone to uh, the lecture on deep learning. Um, just one more reminder that if you want to be in cloud computing, that's the other room. Uh, the schedule is wrong. This is the deep learning room. So uh, we only have an hour and a half for this lecture, and deep learning is a really big topic. Um, and uh, so I'm going to just start out by saying a little bit about what this lecture is and what this lecture isn't. Um, Basically, this lecture is not going to be an in-depth theoretical introduction to deep learning or machine learning or any of that. Rather, this is going to be more like the tutorials we've been doing. This is going to be a hands-on uh, live coding demo where we start by talking about PyTorch. Uh, this, is, this is really an introduction to PyTorch uh, uh, lecture, more so than a deep learning lecture. With my uh, antenna, I think. Um, yeah, this is this is really more of an uh, introduction to PyTorch uh, le a lecture than a deep learning lecture. Um, but that said, deep learning is really anything you do with neural networks that have multiple layers. Um, although I think if you ask a lot of experts in the field what deep learning is, you'll get a lot of different answers and probably several people who tell you that that's not the right term anymore. Um, I don't really have a horse in that race, but uh, I'm here to talk about uh, PyTorch and how we do some very simple kind of uh, deep learning uh, 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 optimizations. So um, what I think the plan is going to be today is we're going to start by just talking a little bit about PyTorch um, and how it is similar to and different from NumPy. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about gradient descent and how we do automatic gradients with PyTorch, because that's a really big part of pretty much any optimization you do with PyTorch. And then finally, we're going to try, if we have time, to build a very simple uh, neural network that can take images of clothing and classify what kind of clothing they are. I don't have a whole lot of faith we're going to get through all of that, to be honest. Um, I, if we get through the gradients, I'll be pretty happy. Uh, but uh, before we start, I'm going to go ahead and point out that if you go to the curriculum folder and you go to the Benson Deep Learning folder, there is an introduction to PyTorch uh, notebook here that is basically the notebook I'm going to be following, except that there's all kinds of text and stuff in this notebook to explain uh, the various steps and things. Um, this is sort of the tutorial if you, uh, if you don't come to the lecture. Um, I'm not actually going to use it, uh, or leave, I will probably keep it open just in case we start to run out of time and I need to copy and paste things instead of typing them out, but I'm instead going to just uh, start a new, um, a new notebook here, and we're just, we're just going to live code through this. Okay, so uh, PyTorch is a library that's uh, it's similar to TensorFlow if you've used it. I personally have not used TensorFlow a whole lot. I know they're very similar. Um, and they do a lot of the same things, but we're just going to talk about PyTorch today. Um, PyTorch is a little bit like NumPy. So if you've used NumPy quite a bit, there's going to be a lot of PyTorch that's going to feel familiar. However, PyTorch kind of has its own way of doing things. Um, and in many cases, it's not very compatible with NumPy, and we'll kind of see some examples of that. So uh, let's just to start out, let's go ahead and do the first thing we would typically do if we wanted to use some new library, and that's to import it. So uh, for PyTorch, we import it as Torch. That's the name of the library. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and import a few other things here uh, while, while we're importing. So I'm going to say from Torch, import NN. NN stands for neural network. So there's going to be some tools in the neural network uh, uh, namespace that we're going to, or module that we're going to want to use. So I'm going to import NN. Um, then I'm going to import uh, from Torch Dot utils dot data. I'm going to import the data loader class. Um, oh, yeah, question. Yeah, of course. Okay. Um, I may need to make that smaller to see some of the figures, but that's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to import this data loader class. I'll talk about it in a minute, but a data loader is basically a class whose job is to feed uh, uh, information into your model as you're training it. Um, we'll come, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, additionally, because we're going to want to use a sample data set that PyTorch has built in, I'm going to say, whoops, from Torch Vision. Torch Vision is another PyTorch module that includes some uh, computer vision stuff. Um, from Torch Vision import data sets. So data sets is a module of Torch Vision that includes a bunch of kind of built-in sample data. Then we're going to import something called from 
porch vision dot transforms import two tensor. I will talk about what two tensor is in just a second. And finally, because I think we're going to want to plot some of our results, uh, we're going to go ahead and import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. So uh, um, if you if you haven't done matplotlib visualization in the past, if you didn't make it to the visualization tutorial, um, don't worry too much about this. This is a library for plotting things in Jupyter Notebook, and I'll just kind of try to explain what each function does. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, for people on Zoom, the question is when we have something like this, where we say from torch.nn or from torch import nn, is that just a convenience thing? Like, could I just say torch.nn everywhere instead? Uh, that depends. Um, for this uh, module in particular, nn, you can, but not every package includes all of its sub packages. So sometimes you actually do have to do this. In this case, um, I'm doing it for convenience, though. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and run that. That will just import a bunch of modules for us. Okay, so let's start by just uh, doing some very simple PyTorch operations. And for those of you who know NumPy pretty well, these will look very familiar. So we'll start by saying, uh, we're just gonna make it uh, what's called a tensor. Um, now in NumPy, we have arrays, uh, n-dimensional arrays, and they can have any number of dimensions. They can be matrices, or they can in fact represent tensors. Um, in PyTorch, you have the base, same basic concept. It's just that instead of being called an n-dimensional array, it's called a tensor. So we're going to say torch dot zeros, just like we would with NumPy. And I'm going to make a 10 by 3 uh, matrix of zeros. And uh, much like with NumPy, we can operate on these uh, pretty much the same way. So if, for example, I want to set um, all of the uh, all of the rows in the first column equal to one. I could say u colon comma one or colon comma zero. I'm sorry. Equals one. So that will set um, all of the rows because this colon, just like in NumPy, stands for all the rows, and this zero stands for the first column. Um, and I can set those all to one. So that's just like in NumPy two. Um, just like with NumPy, we can do simple operations. So I can say u equals u minus, whoops, minus 0 0.5 times 3. And uh, finally, I'm just going to print to you, whoops, print to you at the end of this. So when we run this, uh, we get back uh, this matrix. It looks a lot like the way uh, NumPy arrays look when they get displayed, except it prints a tensor instead of an array. Any questions so far? OK. So despite the fact that tensors and arrays uh, look a lot like each other and seem to operate much the same way, uh, they're not actually very compatible. So supposing we import NumPy as, in, as we always do, and then we make uh, an array uh, that's also 10 by 3, and then we try to call a torch function on it. So um, in NumPy, we could say numpy.mean of a, and it would give us back zero because the mean of those values of those 30 zeros is zero. On the other hand, if we try to say torch.mean um, of a, it's going to give us an error and say, I don't, I don't know what this is. This is an array. It's not a tensor. I only work with tensors. So um, what this is telling us is that PyTorch really wants, only wants to operate on uh, its own tensors. It doesn't want to operate on other kinds of data structures. This is fairly different than NumPy, because in NumPy, um, you can ask for the mean of a list, uh, even though a list is not a NumPy array. So uh, this is some one way in which uh, PyTorch and uh, NumPy differ. Now, remember, we imported that two tensor uh, type at the very beginning. This is the kind of class that we'll see in a little bit that we used inside of neural network modules to turn something like an image into a tensor as part of the steps. So that's why we imported that, and we'll get to that later. Uh, any questions so far? OK. So um, suppose, supposing we have a tensor, uh, what did I call this tensor up here? U, I think. Okay, supposing we have a tensor and we want to convert it back into a NumPy array so we can do some NumPy stuff with it. Um, 
there's a way to do that. First of all, you have to call u.detach. And this function essentially detaches the tensor from uh, the PyTorch backend, which keeps track of gradient calculations. Um, now, we'll talk about that in a minute, but the basic idea is that when you operate on PyTorch tensors, it keeps track of the operations you've performed and where they started and where they've ended. So that if you then ask it later for the gradient, it can look back at the calculation you did and actually solve for the gradient and give you a back a gradient vector. Um, so uh, in order to uh, get a NumPy, uh, a NumPy array from a PyTorch tensor, we need to first of all detach it from the backend so that when we edit the NumPy array, it doesn't mess up the gradient calculations. Um, and then we can call the NumPy method on that detached tensor, and that will give us back a NumPy array. That's otherwise exactly the same. Now, I'm not certain of this, but I suspect that under the hood, PyTorch actually stores everything as NumPy arrays, um, but that's, uh, that's something I haven't verified. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, make a simple function. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a curve, and I'm going to define it parametri parametrically. So what that means is I'm going to define a function x of t and a function y of t, and then as t varies, x and y will vary, and we can define a kind of curve that way. So to see what that looks like, I'm going to go ahead and define a function called curve of t. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to assume that t is a tensor, that whatever the argument the user passes is a tensor. Um, I'm going to say x equals torch dot sine of t minus 0 0.5, and y equals torch dot cosine of t times 2 plus torch dot cosine of 2 times t plus 0 0.75. Okay, this is not a special equation or anything. This is not like something you should recognize. This is just something I made up. It looks a little bit like the Star Trek logo. Um, and uh, for this, I'm just going to have it return X and Y. And uh, let's go ahead, uh, I'll just define that. But let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and make a plot. So I'm going to define a, a tensor T. I'm going to use the linspace function. So lin, torch.linspace is just like numpy.linspace. It takes a start value, an end value, and the number of points you want in between them. And it gives you back a vector of evenly spaced values between the start and the end, um, however many values you ask. So since this is a sinusoidal function that we've defined, I'm going to have uh, the start and the end be negative pi and pi. So, And let's have 100 points in between. And just to show you what that looks like, that's basically uh, a long vector. Um, if I make that a little smaller, it's easier to see. That starts at negative pi and goes all the way to pi, and every step is uh, whatever, pi over 100, or 2 pi over 100. And then I'm going to say x, y equals curve of t. Now, uh, PyTorch, must, much like NumPy, you can call functions like sine and you can pass them a single value, or you can pass them a vector and it will give you back the sine of every element in the vector. Or you can pass the matrix and it'll give you back the sine of every element in the matrix. Um, uh, PyTorch uh, functions, just like NumPy functions, work that way. So when we, when we call this function, we'll see that we get uh, back, that wasn't a very good way to print this, but uh, we'll see that we get back a tensor of x values and a tensor of y values. Okay, make that a little bigger again. Okay, so let's go ahead and just plot that to see what it looks like. So I'm going to use the pyplot.plot function. I'm going to pass it x and y. Uh, you can actually pass tensors to pyplot. It doesn't really mind. Um, I'm going to plot these as a black line. And then just to kind of orient us, I'm going to plot some axes real quick. Uh, so. Let's go ahead and plot from, uh, so this is basically plotting a line from, uh, uh, from x from negative 3 to 3 along y equals 0. Um, and then we'll also plot uh, the equivalent uh, y line. OK, so there is the curve that we just drew. So we have our axes. And like I said, it looks a little bit like the Star Trek logo, um, 
this is just some arbitrary curve that we can now kind of operate on as an example. Any questions so far? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Do you find any caveats with uh, using MATLAB for these kind of programming uh, scripts? Um, is it, I don't know, I feel like it may have some uh, kind of limitations. Sorry, so you're, you're asking if, if I, uh, what I think about using MATLAB for these kinds of calculations? Yes, correct. Uh, so as far as I know, MATLAB doesn't have a built-in auto differentiator. So that's a, a big difference between MATLAB and PyTorch. Um, it's possible that in newer versions of MATLAB, they've added some of that. But um, one of the great things about PyTorch is you can basically just uh, calculate something the way you would in NumPy, and then you can ask PyTorch what the gradient was, and it just gives it back to you like almost instantaneously. So um, when it comes to optimization, where a lot of times we're doing gradient descent, uh, that's the real advantage. And so um, while, while MATLAB is great for a lot of kinds of calculations and may even have a built-in uh, differentiator at this point, um, PyTorch is kind of the, the gold standard in that, uh, that area. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to take a second here to try something. I hope this works. Um, and I just want to use it to talk really quickly about what gradient descent is. So uh, bear with me for one moment. OK, so I hope you're all seeing these axes. Um, so uh, when we're doing optimization, uh, oftentimes what we have is some kind of function. So I'm just going to draw some arbitrary function here. Um, so this is our function. I'm going to call this f of x. Um, now, there's no reason that uh, f of x needs to be a function of one value. It's really this is uh, y equals f of x. And there's no reason this couldn't be something like y equals f of x, y, z. But uh, I'm just going to use a simple example of just uh, f of x. Um, well, never mind. Uh, OK, so the way that gradient descent works, um, typically when we're doing some kind of optimization, what we want to do is we want to find the minimum value of this function. And this isn't like a nice function. This isn't something like sine of t plus t squared or something. This isn't, this isn't an easy uh, function to differentiate so, uh, or to, uh, to, to optimize. So what we want to do is we want to start with some kind of guess as to where the minimum is. So I'm just going to pick a guess. I'm going to pick a guess over here. And the way gradient descent works is that um, now that we've got a, a starting guess, uh, we want to know which direction the minimum lies in. And uh, the easiest way to take, to take a guess as to which direction the uh, minimum lies in is to calculate the gradient. So the gradient is just the uh, slope of the function at that particular uh, point, and it always points in the direction that is maximally increasing. Um, so if we want to find uh, the minimum, we just go in the other direction. So uh, the gradient is pointing up, so we're going to move uh, our point in uh, the downward direction. And we pick some arbitrary step size, and we step along that gradient that, direct, that distance. So for example, we started here, um, and now we're going to uh, follow this line down to about here, let's say. OK, well, this, this point isn't even on the curve, but we have an x value for this point. So we're going to calculate the value of the curve at that x value. And now we have a point that's closer to the minimum. And so we can just repeat the process. We can calculate the gradient once again. Here, the gradient is about like this. We can step along it to somewhere over here. And now we're much closer to the minimum. And we can just keep doing this until we're basically at the minimum. And the closer we get, the closer the gradient will get to zero. And eventually, we'll, uh, we'll reach something like convergence where uh, the next step isn't changing very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the question uh, for people on Zoom is, how would this handle a multiple local minimum? Well, it would find the local minimum. <laughs> so uh, when you one of the problems with gradient descent is that while it's a very fast way to minimize a function or to find the minimum of a function, um, it is very vulnerable to local minima. So uh, perhaps somewhere off uh, beyond the range of the plot here that I've, I've drawn, 
there's a much lower minimum. But because we started at this particular point, we're only going to find the closest minimum. So when you're doing gradient descent, it pays to start at many places or to have some other strategy to try to, to find your local minimum and to find the global minimum. That's a little outside the scope of this course. So, um, uh, but thanks for the question. That's a great one. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about gradient descent? It's not important that you understand the math behind this or anything. It's just important that you kind of understand it conceptually. Okay. And I just want to emphasize that, uh, you know, uh, as I said, there's no reason this has to be a function of one variable. If you have a function of 100,000 variables, f of x1, x2, x3, up to x100,000, you can calculate the gradient for that function, and you can always calculate it. Uh, we know how to calculate gradients for any arbitrary uh, equation, pretty much. So, um, so even if uh, you have a really high dimensional problem uh, that's much more complicated than this simple example, um, you can still calculate the gradient, you can still step along it, and you can always find a local minimum that way, as long as your function is smooth. And uh, the reason that's important for PyTorch and for deep learning in particular uh, is because, let's see if I can get this back. Okay. Um, uh, the reason this is important for PyTorch in particular is because uh, when we, uh, uh, the way that, that we operate in deep learning is we kind it kind of works by uh, coming up with an arbitrary set of, of, of equations that uh, have parameters that we can adjust that operate on the input and turn it into the output. And although this is a really simplified and uh, kind of strange way to describe neural networks, what you do is you have these parameters that are basically forming this sim simple linear equation that's just very long. And you can take all those parameters and you can perform gradient descent on them. So even though it's a neural network, there's still some underlying set of equations that we can minimize. Does that make sense to everyone more or less? Okay, great. So honestly, we're making great time, so that's good. So as an example of a gradient descent problem, um, we're going to uh, take this curve that, that we, we drew a little bit ago, and we're going to ask the question, um, what point on this curve is closest to the origin? So uh, that's not a real easy question to answer. I mean, we, we could absolutely take the, uh, well, it's up there somewhere, take the equations we wrote in terms of sine and cosine, and we could take the derivatives of them, and then we could find the zeros, and those will correspond to minimum and maximum, and we could, we, could, we could do this analytically if we wanted to, but we're not. We're going to do it numerically using PyTorch. So in order, to, uh, in order to find the point that's closest to the origin, we need to start by defining the function we're minimizing. And in this case, it's just the distance of the point on the curve to the origin. So I'm going to define that as a function called loss. And loss is a function of t, because t is how we define points on this curve. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say x, y equals curve of t. That gives us the point uh, for that value of t. And then uh, the distance, let's call that distance, is uh, just according to the basic Euclidean distance equation, uh, square root of x minus zero plus y minus zero. Oops. Now, obviously you don't need to put the minus zero there. I'm just putting it explicitly so that we have the, uh, the origin kind of coded into our, our example here. And then we want to return the distance. So uh, that's our loss function. Hopefully everyone agrees that when we find the minimum value of this function, we'll have found the point closest to the origin on the curve. All right, so let's uh, let's just make sure that works. Um, so let's say t equals torch dot tensor of just a value like 1.5. And then uh, let's just evaluate the loss of t. And what we find is that for whatever x and y correspond to t equals 1.5, there, the distance from the origin is about 0.5 or so. So this seems to be working as expected. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah, uh, great question. So um, the question for everyone on Zoom is, what is this two, what do these two asterisks uh, mean? Um, that is the power operation. So a star star b is a raised to the b power. 
Any other questions? So mathematically, you're just looking at, um, or you're trying to find the derivative, but in, in this uh, separate point by point base, is that correct, by distance? So um, we haven't done anything with the derivative yet, but right here, we're just, we're just defining the distance from a particular value t on the curve, because the value t corresponds to some x, y point along this curve. We're just mm -hmm. finding the distance from that point to the origin. And what we're going to do okay. next is calculate the gradient. So you're just a step ahead of us. Okay. Sorry, okay. thank you. No problem. Uh, any other questions? All right, I'm going to plow ahead then. Um, okay, so let's suppose now that um, you know we've we've seen that we can calculate this distance, but now we also need to be able to calculate the gradient if we want to do a gradient descent optimization. So uh, we can do that, and it's almost exactly the same. The only real difference is that we first start by saying torch.tensor 1.5, and then we're going to pass an optional argument, which is requires grad equals true. That tells PyTorch that uh, we're going to calculate a gradient, and this tensor t is a parameter for that gradient. And so we're going to want to know the gradient in terms of t. Then we go ahead and calculate dist equals loss of t. OK, um, hopefully we get the same answer. Yeah, except now we have this little uh, piece of information that's uh, related to tracking the gradient. Now, it doesn't really matter what this, uh, this is right now. Um, don't worry about that. It's just telling us it is tracking the gradient there. Now, uh, we need to tell PyTorch that we're done with the calculation uh, and, so we, uh, and that we're ready to calculate the gradient. So uh, what we say is dist.backward. Uh, back, the, the method here is called backward because it's a backward gradient propagation method. Um, the basic idea is we start with whatever our output value is, that is the, the function we're minimizing, the distance, and we compute the gradient back to the parameters. So this will actually uh, return, it doesn't return anything, it just does that computation internally. And we can now ask for t, because t was our input parameter to this function that calculated the distance. We can ask for t.grad, and it gives us back the gradient at that point. Now, this is just a, a function of one parameter, so the gradient is just one value. But nonetheless, uh, this is the gradient at that value of t. Any questions so far? OK, so now we're going to put all that together, and we're going to combine it with a PyTorch optimizer in order to actually perform a minimization that finds the point that is the closest to the origin. So uh, for this, we're going to start by picking our start point. Uh, this is the starting value of t that we start the optimization from. So I'm going to say uh, t equals torch.tensor. I'm just going to start with the value 2.1. That's not quite an arbitrary choice, but it may as well be an arbitrary choice. Um, I'm going to say that this requires the gra gradient, requires grad equals true. OK, now we need to, uh, now we need to, to define an optimizer. So the optimizer is just a PyTorch um, uh, object that handles uh, the actual steps of the optimization. And although I just explained gradient descent as if it were fairly straightforward and simple and there was just one algorithm, there's actually several dozen ways to do gradient descent. Um, some of them are stochastic, some of them are deterministic, some of them uh, adjust the step size to try to make sure that you're staying within certain bounds. There's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, and Again, that's all kind of outside of the scope of this, uh, this tutorial, but a very simple and straightforward one that generally works pretty well it is called SDG, which stands for Stochastic Gradient Descent. And it's basically a version of the gradient descent that adds a little bit of uh, random noise to your descent to try to get around certain kinds of problems in the optimization. Um, so I'm going to just find this as optimizer equals torch.optim.sgd. And uh, what we need to pass it. Uh, are two things. First of all, the parameters. So you give it a list of the parameters that it's optimizing over. Um, so when it's when it's taking steps, it's adjusting this value t. So basically, um, what we're saying, you know, in in the example I drew, we said minimize. We were minimizing that function f of x. Um, this t is sort of like the the x value um, because it's the, the the input to the function we're minimizing. And then we need to give it another parameter, which is called LR, which stands for the learning rate. 
And uh, this is a very common uh, parameter throughout PyTorch. You use it in almost in, in any, any optimization you do. Um, but basically what it corresponds to is how big of a step do you want to take when you follow that gradient? So you can imagine if you took a really big step, you would step all the way past the minimum. And when you took your next step, you might step even farther in the other direction past the minimum, and that can be really bad. So you want your learning rate to be reasonably low, but um, you also don't want it to be too low because then it can take a long time to converge. Uh, I find learning rates a little opaque in PyTorch, to be honest. Um, we're going to pick a value of 0 0.05, not because 0 0.05 really means anything, just because it works well for this problem. Um, and unfortunately, with optimization, a lot of times, values just happen to work well for the problem. And there may be a theoretical reason why they work well, but it's often very difficult to determine what that is. So this is something I determined experimentally. And chances are, if you do similar problems, you will take the same approach. Um, but for now, this, this value will work. OK. So now we're going to take some steps in the optimization process. So we're going to say for step number in and I'm just going to take uh, 20 steps in range 20. OK. Uh, inside of this uh, loop, the first thing we need to do is basically signal to the optimizer that we're starting a new step. And to do this, we call a, fun a method optimizer.0 grad. Um, that literally zeroes out the gradient, uh, the vector it uses to store the gradient. That's why it's called zero grad. But for our uh, purposes, what this really is doing is telling PyTorch that we're starting a new step. So anything you were remembering about the gradient, you can you can forget. Because uh, the last step will have calculated a gradient. We don't want that gradient to get confused with the new steps gradient. Uh, we're then going to go ahead and just call dist equals loss of t. Remember, we define t up here. So we can uh, run the distance, uh, the distance function there. And uh, then I'm going to have it print a little message just so we can see what's happening in the steps. So it's going to print the step number. Um, we're going to print out t. Uh, I'm going to turn it into a float to print it. Um, and then we're going to print out the loss. OK, so that's just a little message so we can see the progress as it goes. And uh, then we're going to call that dist.backward function like we did earlier to tell PyTorch, OK, time to calculate the gradient uh, of uh, dist in terms of t. And then we just tell the optimizer to take a step. That's, and that's it. That's, that's the whole uh, optimization protocol. So I'm just going to push Shift-Enter to run this. And what we get out is a bunch of step numbers. Uh, we have values of t. These are changing. And what we can see here is that the loss is, whoops, uh, the loss is slowly going down. Now, it's not going down very fast, but it starts out at about 0.8. So the distance of our first choice of t was about 0.83. And by the time we finished, it was about 0.448. So it did minimize. It got to about half its original value. So let's see what it was. So the value of t that it finds is 2.6991. Um, let's print out the loss, although I think we saw. OK, so it's about 0.43 at the end. Yeah, sorry. It's, uh, I, know it's, uh, I, know, I know I'm going kind of fast because we got a lot to cover, so no problem. I'll let, I'll let you see this for a second. Um, what I'm going to do next, actually, uh, is to go ahead and plot that point that we found. So uh, in a second here, I'm going to scroll up. Once, once I've given you a chance to copy all this, I'm going to scroll up and uh, copy and paste the plot we made earlier, and then just add a point to it. Yeah. Uh, I, so was that last part? Yeah, so uh, the, for people on Zoom, the question was uh, the LR parameter that uh, is here. Um, this is what's used in the step, uh, and, and that's correct. The, the learning rate is used in the step. I don't think that the learning rate directly corresponds to the step size. I think they derive the step size from the learning rate, but that, I think, is particular to the kind of optimizer you're using. Uh, 
So in stochastic gradient descent, it may be a little different. Um, but the, I think learning rates are supposed to be kind of constant across different optimizers. So the same learning rate should be about the same in different optimizers. But uh, all that said, like uh, like I said earlier, I find learning rates a little opaque. So I'm not I'm not. That's all all of that that I just said is with about half confidence. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, people on Zoom, the question was, um, is the output and the parameter T somehow linked so that when you calculate, when you call this backward function uh, method, um, it, it updates something in the parameter? Uh, and the answer is yes. So basically because we passed this requires grad equals true option when we made uh, the, the tensor T, that signals to PyTorch that it should keep track of the calculations we use T in so that when we call a backward function, it can update uh, the, the gradient of T. Yeah. Uh, honestly, there's there's no good reason. It's just how I wrote it. Um, so the question was, why do I print before uh, updating the values um, uh, here? So uh, this 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 would have been totally fine if we had uh, done it down here as well. Except it would need to be unindented like that. Any other questions? Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and confirm that uh, we found the right point. So I'm going to go up to this uh, plot we made earlier of the the Star Trek logo, approximately, and I'm going to just copy the contents of this cell, and then I'm going to scroll down to the bottom, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and get x not y not equals curve of t. So t is currently the minimum. Whoops, the minimized t. Um, so down here, I'm going to get uh, uh, the minimized point that we found. And then I'm going to just plot a single red point like that. Oh, shoot. Uh, what happened? Uh, um, my mistake. This seems uh, so. Uh, I had forgotten that you can pass tensors to uh, pi plot functions, but if they're tracking the gradient, then it typically won't allow you to do that. So uh, because uh, these are have tracked gradients, um, we need to call detach uh, dot numpy on them. And there we have it. So. Uh, the point it found was a little bit to the left of y equals zero here, so um, I think that's about right. I didn't go and analytically verify this, but I'm pretty sure that's the minimum closest to where we started. Any questions so far? Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Ah. Uh, that's a great question. So the question was, if you assigned it to another variable, would it still be tracked? So uh, an interesting thing about how this works in Python is suppose I say tt equals t. Um, uh, there's a function you can use in Python to get the memory address of a variable. It's called id. And if we ask for the id of t, we'll get some number. And if we ask for the id of tt, we'll get the exact same number. And that's because when you assign some other variable to an existing variable, there's no copying done. It's, it's literally just pointing to the same place in memory. So uh, TT and T are identical. They're, they're not distinguishable in, the, in Python. So um, when you do this kind of assignment, uh, the gradient will still be tracked because they're actually the same object. However, um, what you could do is you could say TT equals and P dot zeros, oh, whoops, uh, torch dot zeros t dot shape to make a new array or a new tensor. And then you could say tt uh, colon uh, equals t. I think that'll work. No. Uh, well, I guess actually you, you can't do this in this case because it's a single number. <laughs> so uh, normally I was, I was thinking this would be like a vector. But uh, so um, in this case, this is a bad example. But uh, uh, in general, you can you can make a copy of the tensor. So uh, the way we do that in this case would be just to say torch dot tensor t, and in this case uh, t t will be a new um, a new tensor that doesn't track a gradient, and it's giving us a warning about that because you wouldn't usually want to do that on purpose. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions?
Um, I have a question about the detaching the values. Um, could you explain a little bit more about where where is that coming from? Is that um, some sort yeah. of inbuilt property? Yeah. So the the basic the the basic reason that you do that is because um, so up here, let's let me go up to where uh, where where we started tracking this this uh, this gradient. Um, so uh, because we told it, PyTorch to track the gradient here, it's it's put a bunch of extra data attached to this particular uh, this particular tensor. And um, if you if you make a NumPy array out of it, I, I believe the problem is that you can end up uh, uh, changing the tensor in a way that doesn't match the underlying data tracked by PyTorch anymore. So because when you get a NumPy from a tensor, I think you actually get access to the memory of the tensor and you can change the original tensor by changing the NumPy array. Um, the problem that arises is that your gradient calculation data and your actual tensor data can get out of sync. So it's not, it's not like the system's gonna crash if you forget to detach anything. Um, it's just that you might end up with incorrect calculations of gradients somewhere in your code. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, the the tensor T, you mean? Yeah. yeah so uh, the the comment was that the tensor the dimension of the tensor was not clearly defined, and that's right. Um, this was actually a zero dimensional tensor um, because it's just a number. So uh, you're you're allowed to have uh, you know one dimensional tensors of of vectors, but you can also just have um, zero dimensional tensors, uh, like, like the number zero. And if you ask for the shape of that, it'll just tell you back that there's, this isn't, this is a dimensionless quantity basically, or a dimensionless tensor tensor. So, um, that's all allowed. And that is, it is consistent with, uh, mathematics, uh, in that we think of numbers as zero dimensional tensors, but it's not the way we usually think about it in programming. So it's a little more intuitive. Any other questions? Okay. All right, we're actually making pretty good time. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm going to pivot a bit and uh, we're going to start working on a neural network. So um, I, I just wanna pause and say, we're gonna move on from gradient descent. I just wanna ask if anyone has questions about any of that stuff we've covered so far before we move on. Okay, okay. Oh no. Um, so uh, yeah, the the so uh, basically when we when we did this uh, when we did this uh, optimization up here, what we found was the minimum of this loss function. So the loss function calculated the distance between the x y point and the origin, and uh, by by running this optimizer and uh, calculating the gradient of the lost fun loss function and then taking steps along it we find the point that's closest to the origin along our, our curve. So that point that we found was, was actually the minimum of the distance function um, of any point along this curve. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Any other questions? All right, so uh, we're, going to, we're going to spend the rest of this uh, session uh, creating a um, a very simple neural network that uh, takes as input a picture a very a very small picture of a piece of clothing, and as output predicts what kind of clothing it is. So the first thing we need for this kind of problem is a data set that we can use as training data because uh, we need something to train the network with. So we're going to go ahead and define some training data. Um, now, recall at the very beginning of the the uh, um, the notebook, we imported a, a package called datasets, um, and that contains a bunch of built-in datasets that Python just includes. So we're going to use one of those. Um, the dataset is called fashion mist. Uh, sorry, m n i s t. Um, I don't remember what m n uh, m n i s t stands for, but this is a just a very simple database of pictures of clothes. Uh, we're going to need to pass a few arguments here. I'm going to say root equals data. This is just a directory it stores the data set in after it downloads it. 
uh, we're going to say train equals true. Um, that's basically telling uh, telling it that we want this to be a training data set and not a validation data set. So we'll have a separate training and validation data set so we can do cross validation. Um, we'll define the, uh, the test data set in just a second. Um, we're going to tell it to download the data. And we're going to tell it to transform the images into tensors by uh, passing a two tensor object, which makes that transformation happen. Uh, we're then going to define test data, which is also often called validation data. It's going to be the same thing. Um, The only difference is we're going to say train equals false because this is not a training data set. This is the validation data set. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and run that. Now, when you run that, I think it's going to produce a bunch of output. Um, that's fine. That's just telling you it's downloading stuff. Um, I'll leave this up for a second so everyone can uh, see it. Uh, it didn't show me output because I've already downloaded it uh, before. Is anyone having trouble getting that to work? Oh yeah, go ahead. So uh, usually if the training data and the test data are different, uh, are these assignments of train equals true and false uh, making the separation? Or yeah. are there tags that says, uh, I don't know, 10% or 30% are training data and when you assign train equals true that fetches these uh part yeah i i believe it's the letter i think that this uh, data set has uh picked out training and test data set ahead of time so you can just ask for one or the other everyone have time to get this anyone need this still okay okay so, sorry, one second. Okay, my, uh, I think my notes are missing a, a cell, so I wanna just check something real quick. No, okay. All right, so, uh, uh, we're going to go ahead now and define some data loaders. Um, and uh, what, I, what I explained earlier was that uh, data loaders are basically a class whose job is to take pieces of your data set and feed them into your, uh, your optimizer uh, during different steps of the model training. Um, and so we're going to start by defining what's called a batch size. We're going to define that as 64. Um, now, what the batch size is, is that typically in uh, neural network optimizations, um, you you don't uh, you don't show it one example at a time. You show it a whole bunch of examples at a time and have it learn from all of them at once. This is a way of speeding things up and also helping the optimization in some ways. Um, we don't really this it's a little out of the scope uh, of this lesson why batch sizes are good, but uh, they're very common in uh, neural network uh, training, especially convolutional neural network training. Um, and what this really means is that instead of just feeding one image to the, the optimizer at a time, it's going to give it a batch of 64 images. And uh, every step, it'll look at 64 different images. OK. So we're now going to make a data loader for our training data set. Uh, so we make a data loader uh, passing it the training data. And we have to patch it, uh, pass it the batch size. And then we're going to make one for our test data set too. Okay. And uh, just to kind of show you um, what uh, well, what the what the data loader does, um, let's do a simple example. So, four uh, x comma y in test data loader. So data loaders, uh, you typically, what models do or uh, optimizers do is they iterate over a data loader, which is, is kind of what we're doing here. 
Um, and data loaders, when you iterate over them, they give you back tuples, which include uh, the image that you're, you're training on and the true label of that image. So for example, this, this X might be an image of a boot and this Y would be a number that corresponds to the label boot. And uh, that said, uh, it's gonna give us 64 of these at once. So this is actually, X is gonna be a stack of 64 images and Y is going to be a vector of 64 labels. And just to demonstrate that, we'll go ahead and print some messages here. So the shape of X, uh, the way that data loaders give data to uh, optimizers is a little idiosyncratic, um, but basically they're always shaped where the batch size is the first dimension. The number of image channels is the second dimension. And then you have the height and width of the image. Oops. We'll also print the x dot uh, d type just to see uh, what kind of type these are. And then for y, um, uh, we just get one label per batch. OK. Um, and then I don't want to actually do this for all, all the uh, images in the test data set. I just want to show you one example. So I'm actually going to break at the end of this loop, which will end the loop and get us out. So one iteration of that loop shows us that um, our batch size is uh, 64. Um, there's one image channel. So these are black and white images. There's not RGB and alpha channels or anything like that. Um, and the images themselves are 28 by 28. Uh, just to just to see what one of those looks like, so, whoops, uh, um, let's get a single. Uh, so this will say the first item in the batch, uh, the one image channel, um, and then we'll have a twenty-eight by twenty-eight image here, which I'm turning into a NumPy image, and I just want to plot this uh, as an image so that we can see what that looks like there's a picture of a boot. So this is what the image is, the input we're actually training on looks like. Now, um, the label for that boot is the number nine. So that may be a little unintuitive, but in this data set, nine means boot. And so let's go ahead and define what those numbers, those label numbers mean now so we have some key. So in the fashion MNIST labels, the label zero is a t-shirt or a top. Uh, a label one is a trouser. A two is a pullover, which I think is a sweater. Uh, label three is a dress. Uh, label four is a coat. Then sandal. Uh, then shirt. Then sneaker then bag, and then finally ankle boot. Okay, so this is just a key for the labels. So if we wanna know what label nine is, ankle boot. And this indeed is a picture of an ankle boot. So uh, basically just to review that a little bit, when we ask the data loader for uh, one item, what it gives us back is a batch of images and a batch of labels where the images look kind of like this, they're pictures of clothing, and the labels are numbers that correspond to these labels and that, that describe what that image is an image of. Okay, uh, any questions about any of that so far? Yeah. Sorry, I, could you say that again? Right. So the question was, um, when you call the when when you make the uh, the the data loader, like the test data loader, um, it loads things by batch. So 
Uh, I believe what it does is it does load them by batch. It'll load 64 images and uh, feed them into the, uh, or uh, sorry, when you, when you iterate over this, it'll load 64 images at a time. Um, once it's loaded them, it keeps them in memory, but the next time you iterate over it, it will just give you back 64 images the same way. So it always will give you back these batches of images. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Okay, so I think let me skip that. Um, all right. So uh, at this point, we're ready to define an actual neural network. Now, um, uh, a lot of contemporary neural networks are convolutional neural networks. Um, and if we have time, I'm happy to give a short explanation of what a convolutional neural network is. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a simple linear network. Um, and I'll just kind of code it up first, and then I'll kind of explain it um, as we go. So we're going to make a class. This neural network will be a type. It'll be a class. So I'm going to call it neural network. And it's going to inherit from uh, the neural network module class. So recall earlier, uh, we said from torch uh, import nn just for convenience. Um, so this is this is the torch.neural network module. Um, so a, a neural network module type is basically any PyTorch model is going to inherit from module. And so uh, there's a bunch of mechanisms that module defines that our neural network class will have. For the most part, we aren't going to worry about them because they're all stuff that PyTorch manages behind the scenes. What we are going to worry about is initializing the class and writing a function that actually implements the model. So first of all, we'll define our init function. That's underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. Uh, our class will not take any parameters. It's just going to be a simple, straightforward uh, type of object. Um, we'll start by calling the superclass init. So uh, for people who haven't seen this syntax before, basically what this is saying is that our, our neural network type includes a bunch of functionality from this other type. And so when we initialize our neural network, we want to make sure that that type has the chance to initialize itself as well. So um, this line just makes sure that, that this type's initialization function gets called. Uh, next, we're going to make uh, a flattening layer. Now, um, this, is a, this is a kind of funny little uh, thing about PyTorch, but um, what, the way that PyTorch likes to set up its mo models is that it likes you to set them up as a bunch of layers. And the idea is that the information comes in one side and it, it, it kind of filters through the layers and the layers transform it as it goes. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our image matrix and we're going to flatten it into a vector so that we just have a vector of numbers that's easier to work on in a neural network, or at least this kind of neural network. Um, so that's, that's what this first step will do. And this nn.flatten uh, object is an object that it represents a single layer of a model, and it just will flatten whatever uh, tensor you give it. OK, uh, next we're going to make what's called a linear ReLU stack. And what we're going to do is add, first of all, a linear layer. And uh, what nn.linear represents is just a linear transformation of the input to some output. And what it needs to know is how much input it's getting and how much output we want it to produce. And uh, that may sound a little funny, but the idea here is that um, this is just a big, this is sort of like a big matrix. We're just going to have some vector of inputs, which since our images are 28 by 28, the input vector will be uh, a vector of 28 by 28. So I'll put that here. And this linear, uh, this, this linear layer is basically equivalent to a matrix. Um, and we'll take that uh, vector of 28 by 28 uh, times 28 elements, and we'll do a matrix multiplication to transform it into another vector. That's pretty much all this is. And the matrix will get initialized to random starting values when we, when we perform uh, our optimization. 
So uh, basically, this is a linear transformation that's going to transform our image into something else. We don't even know what it is yet, but it's going to transform it into something else, some other vector of numbers. We're going to have that vector of numbers be 512 uh, uh, numbers long. Um, if you change that number a little bit, there's nothing magical about the number 512. Um, if you change that a little bit, this will probably it'll still work just about as well. Uh, we're then going to add what's called a rectified linear unit layer. Now, uh, rectified linear units are very common in all kinds of neural network work, um, especially convolutional neural networks. Uh, the basic idea of a rectified linear unit is any value in its input that is uh, below zero, it sets to zero. That's all it does. Um, and you may be wondering why you would ever want to do that. Uh, and the answer is that it lets you have something like an if statement in, in your network. So because it only operates on values that are negative, you can, um, the previous layer can produce negative values in that linear transformation um, if it wants to forget a value or drop a value or make some kind of decision based on the value. That's sort of a hand wavy conceptual reason why you would use a ReLU. The fact is they work well. And a lot of times in neural networks, um, the fact that they work well is why we use them. Uh, that's just a kind of disappointing thing about how uh, how well we understand the way that, ne that neural networks work. But the reality is that because these work well, we will keep using them. Any questions about these kinds of layers? Okay, so we're just going to add a couple more. Uh, so we'll just say we'll have another linear layer, and it'll be from 512 to 512. So we're just going to do a linear transformation of the vector into another vector of the same size. And then we'll add another rectified linear unit. And we'll do just one more. And uh, we'll go from 512 to 10, because that's the number of labels we have in our data set. So, um, and finally, uh, whoops, we'll add one more linear unit. Now, uh, notice that at the end, I'm transforming whatever, uh, so, so, this stack here, um, what it's going to do is it's going to start, we're going to flatten the image, uh, the 28 by 20 image into a vector. We're going to linearly recombine that vector into another vector of size 512. We'll do a rectification. And then we'll linearly um, recombine that 512 uh, length vector into another 512 length vector, rectify it again, and then uh, convert that 512 length vector into a 10 length vector. And the reason we want 10 is because we want this to produce a probability that the particular image we saw belongs to each of the 10 labels. So uh, ideally, when we showed a picture of a boot, uh, or an ankle boot, which we know is label nine from our earlier example, um, what this network will give us is a bunch of zeros in uh, the vector elements 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and something like a 1 or very close to a 1 in uh, element 9 because nine is the label for boot. Yeah. Yeah, so for the people on Zoom, the question is, uh, is this 28 by 28? It, that's specific to our data, but the 512 is just kind of an arbitrary number that works. Um, that's correct. So because the inputs we're operating on are 28 by 28 in size, that's why we're we're telling it that our input is 28 times 28 in length. And this 512 is, is arbitrary. You can make this 1024, and I'm sure it'll work at least as well. Um, and uh, generally speaking, uh, this, this value is probably, it, like I said, there's nothing magic about this value. It's just a value that seems to work pretty well. Go ahead, yeah. We'll... Right. Yeah, so uh, the question was, um, so we have to hard code this. So normally we wouldn't want to hard code this. We'd want to we'd draw it from our input data or something like that. Um, and that's correct. Uh, we're hard coding it here because we're just doing a simple example. Additionally, if you're, if, if you're working with uh, PyTorch's convolutional neural network uh, units, they tend to operate on images no matter what their height and width is. They just have to know how many channels you have. But that's a whole other bag of worms that we're not going to have time to get into. Um, and then you had a question, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the question was, given that this last vector is uh, a vector of probabilities for each label, do they always sum to one? Uh, no, they do not always sum to one. And in fact, uh, something that tends to be true of neural networks is that it's much, much easier to train a neural network to produce either great big numbers or little tiny numbers, and then to convert those into probabilities than it is to uh, have it produce probabilities. So um, the way we do that is we use like uh, the arc tangent function, for example, which at negative infinity becomes negative pi and at positive infinity becomes pi. And we just scale that down to be between zero and one and that'll convert a number on the real number line into a probability. Um, that's, uh, that's a little more advanced than I was planning to get to, but uh, regardless, the answer is, is no. Even after we do that con uh, conversion, the answer is no. We often get ve uh, vectors that don't sum to one, but what we usually do is just take whichever is the highest value and assume that's the label. That's a great question. Yeah. Ah, that's a good question. So uh, the question was, would the architecture of this uh, network be different if we had a three-dimensional image? Yeah, the answer, the answer is yes. We'd probably want to do this. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, so in this particular example, because uh, it's it's just a very simple kind of example, we could probably keep the same, uh, the same uh, architecture. My guess is that this architecture would not work very well for 3D images because it's made for very simple, small amounts of data. Um, if uh, in general, so if you're using a 3D image like a brain image, like a, an fMRI image, for example, um, you're probably going to be wanting you're, you're probably going to want to use the convolutional neural network because they operate better when you have a big image like a bunch of data. Um, and in that case, you would need your convolution to be a 3D convolution so that it was convolu convolu uh, convolving over X, Y, and Z, and not just the the individual frames of the image. Um, that's a great question, though. Uh, yeah, so CNNs are neural networks. They're just a particular kind of neural network. Um, and uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll do a quick explanation of why. I will, and if not, I can do that later. But uh, yeah, and you had a question in the back. Ah. Okay, so the, the question is why why have these rectified linear units after each transformation and would it be different if we just put one at the end. Um, so uh, that's a really hard question for me to answer because I'm, I'm not enough of an expert on exactly what rectified linear units do in these equations. Um, like I said, my intuition or the intuition I would I would encourage you to think with is that. Um, a rectified linear unit is kind of like a simple if statement where it's saying if you're less than zero we change your value otherwise we leave it. Um, so the rectified linear unit is kind of like, here, make a transformation of the data, and then we'll do a filter on it and run this sort of if statement. And then we'll do it again a couple more times. And that lets the neural network make a couple of like, quote unquote, decisions. Um, that's, that's a very hand wavy uh, way to describe this, but that's, that's about the depth of my intuition is on this. So um, other questions? Okay. So uh, let's go on and now define the actual function that implements the model. So uh, this function is called forward, the forward function of the model. Um, it, of course, takes the self parameter because it's a method. And then it takes the input, which we'll just call x. Um, now, the x will be whatever the, uh, wh whatever the, the batch of inputs was, um, but we're not going to worry too much about that. Um, we're just going to say uh, first x equals self dot flatten. So here we use this uh, this flatten object we created to transform the input into a flattened version of the input. And then uh, we're going to say logits equals self dot linear ReLU stack x, and we'll return logits. Now, uh, why did I call this logits? Um, so uh, in response to one of the questions a second ago, I mentioned that it's easier to train a model to produce really big numbers or really small numbers. Um, and uh, here, I'll make this a little smaller so that you can see it all at once. Um, uh, it's easier to produce really big numbers or really small numbers. Um, and we can take those really big or really small numbers 
and run them through a sigmoid function like uh, the uh, the arctangent, for example, and convert that to a probability. Um, Logia is just the name for the really big or really small number version of a probability. So before you've converted uh, the output into a probability, it's called a logit. Um, and that's why we call it that. Uh, PyTorch actually prefers to operate on logits. There's a variety of reasons for that. Um, but uh, uh, basically, we'll, we'll, we'll let the model produce logits, and that's fine. OK, so uh, I'll go ahead and define that. I think we're done with that, that uh, definition. Um, I'll, anyone need me to leave this up a little longer? All right, so let's go ahead and define a model. And we can go ahead and print it. What did I do? Did I misspell something? Oh, oh, uh, I, I, I tried to call a function. Uh, I, I, I did, I did type something wrong. Um, so. This self dot linear ReLU stack should have been self dot linear ReLU stack equals and n dot sequential. Um, neural network dot sequential is just a sequence of layers that you put together kind of in a stack. Um, so that's why that didn't work. So let's try that again. Okay, that time it worked. So uh, when you print a model, um, it actually will print all of its layers out in this nice kind of preformat. So here it's telling us that we have this flattened layer and then we have this linear. Uh, stack. OK. Um, any questions so far? OK, so now uh, what we have is a, a test and train data set where we have images matched to correct labels for those images. And we have a neural network that defines a bunch of parameters inside of these uh, linear transformations. So each of those linear transformations basically has a matrix of parameters inside that performs the linear, the particular linear transformation. So for example, this final linear layer has a, uh, a 10 by 512 matrix, um, which will turn a 512 uh, length vector into a length 10 vector. And when we create this model, um, those weights in that matrix are just gonna be randomized. There are some random values and they're going to transform the input in a very random way. But recall that when we do a gradient descent optimization, we have to start with a random value and uh, descend until we find a minimum. And that's basically what we're gonna do here. Uh, we're going to, um, uh, we, 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 we're going to use the images and the labels to determine uh, uh, a loss function. And then we're going to minimize the parameters inside of these linear units until they do a good job of predicting the labels uh, compared to the images. So to do that, we need to start by defining a loss function. And we can actually use a built-in loss function for this. It's called the cross entropy loss. Um, we're, uh, we're not gonna go into the details of what the cross entropy loss function is, but uh, a very short version of it is that um, when you when you you're producing a probability that something matches a particular label, the cross entropy is a good uh, loss function for uh, matching labels to probabilities of labels. And then we need to uh, define an optimizer again. And we're actually going to use the same optimizer, torch dot optim dot sgd. Uh, however, we instead of giving it the parameter t, which is the one parameter we were minimizing last time, we're going to tell it that we want to minimize our model's parameters. And all PyTorch models, um, because we inherited from that neural network.module class, um, there's a built-in parameters uh, method, which will give you the, the list of all the parameters in this model. So that'll, that'll basically give the optimizer all of the parameters in these linear units. Uh, and it'll know to, to minimize all of those. Uh, for this particular uh, minimization, a learning rate of e, 1e e negative 3 works pretty well. Um, you can try a different learning rate if you want. Um, I'm going to use this one. OK, so now we're actually going to perform the minimization or the optimization. So 
Uh, first of all, I'm going to ask for the size uh, whoops, of uh, our training data set. Um, if you want to know how many objects are in a data uh, in a data loader, you can ask for the length of its data set. Um, data loaders have data sets. Those are kind of internal PyTorch objects that track the actual data, whereas the data loader's job is to feed the, that data in the data set to the model. Now we're going to um, we're going to iterate. Uh, I'm going to say for batch num and x comma y and enumerate train data loader. Uh, just in case anyone hasn't seen the enumerate function before, um, the idea behind the enumerate function is uh, if you enumerate, uh, that's maybe a bad example. If you enumerate a list, it gives you back a bunch of tuples uh, that just count the, the list elements. So the first uh, for the list ABC, we get 0A, 1B, 2C. That's what enumerate does. So this is basically saying um, for everything in train data loader, which we saw earlier gives us back a tuple of the image and the label. Um, and we're going to get also the, the number of things we've gone through, the number of batches we've gone through as we, as we go. So first, we need to compute the prediction. Uh, so we run the model. Um, uh, you know, first, I think we need to zero the gradient. So we zero the gradient. Then we're going to calculate the prediction. Um, that the model makes uh, for this particular uh, input image. So it, that's going to produce some label. It's probably going to be wrong at the beginning because we just have randomized uh, parameters, um, but it's going to pr produce some label. Uh, we're then going to uh, run our loss function uh, to calculate the loss. Um, and uh, then we're going to do the backward propagation of the gradient. And finally, we're going to take a step. Um, and then uh, we're going to take this. This is going to run through a lot of uh, a lot of steps. So I'm just going to say if batch num is divisible by 100, uh, we'll, we'll grab some, some information. This will uh, tell us what the loss uh, is. And uh, this will tell us how many um, items we've shown the optimizer so far. So I'm just going to print those out. And this will print them out with some nice, uh, nice formatting. OK, so if, uh, if, if you don't understand what, what uh, this here is doing, basically it's saying every, every 100 times through this loop, um, just print out a pretty uh, message that says what the current loss is and uh, kind of how we're doing on the, the optimization. But I'll go ahead and run this now. Oh, I made some mistake. Did I misspell the name of the forward function? I did. I, I didn't misspell it. I indented it one too many times. <laughs> so if we unindent that and rerun it, uh, hopefully you all didn't make the same mistake. Um, but if you did, you'll just need to unindent that and run it again. Um, I'm going to run all these cells again and see if this works this time. There we go. OK, so now it's actually running the optimizer. And you can see that although it's not going down very fast, it is going down. So um, that said, what this loss actually means is a little hard to understand. Uh, I don't know what the value 2.24 really, really represents, um, but it does represent some matching of the output probabilities of our model with the, uh, the various correct labels of the images. OK, so it looks like it's finished. Um, so we now have a trained model. So let's go ahead and uh, make an example plot to see how our model is doing. So 
I'm going to say uh, fig axes equals plot dot subplots. Um, I'm going to print uh, four images and put titles on them so we can see uh, whether the, the model is accurate. Um, I'll go ahead and give this a fig size. Um, I don't know if uh, if this is all is this uh, syntax is familiar to you all, but this is basically making uh, a single uh, matplotlib figure with four different axes on it that we can plot four different images on. Um, and then I'll say um, I'm just going to flatten the axes so it's just a vector of axes instead of a matrix of axes. Um, it'll still display as a matrix of axes, but this just makes it easier to loop over. And then for x batch comma y batch in test data loader because we want to we want to look at the tests now since we've uh, trained on the training data set um and uh i i want to add something here so that every time we run this cell it produces a different set of images uh so i'm just going to put in a little random thing here if we draw a random number and it's less than 0 0.9 um then we will continue oops, uh, meaning we'll start the loop over again so this way um, if we run this many times, we'll get different uh, different images printed uh, as examples. Okay, and then we're going to say for um, x x y in zip axes x batch y batch. So uh, recall that when we iterate over the test data loader or any data loader, it gives us back batches of image and batches of labels. So um, uh, what we have here in X batch and Y batch are a bunch of images and a bunch of labels, and we want to just uh, draw one image and one label at a time. So we're going to iterate over these. Um, and we'll say ax.imshow x, and we'll just, we'll just uh, um, because, because there's only one image channel, we want to just uh, take the x0 because that's the first image channel. Then we're going to grab the label. We do that by saying what's the maximum, the argmax value of the uh, predicted vector. So um, what argmax does, uh, argmax is a function that gives you the index of the maximum value in a vector. So basically our uh, prediction is a 10 dimensional uh, uh, length 10 vector. And we wanna find the highest probability in that vector and get the, uh, the corresponding label for it. So if the highest probability in that vector is um, the very last element, the ninth element, uh, argmax will return nine. And that tells us that the label nine is the most probable label for that particular image. Um, then we're going to grab the name of that label. And we'll also get the uh, so uh, the Y name is the correct name because Y is the correct label uh, that we get from the data loader. This label here, I haven't named these very well, but this label here is the predicted label according to the, uh, the model. So we'll get the label name. And then I just wanna set the title of the image to uh, be the, the names of those labels so we can see what uh, how it did. So I'll say label name plus. So uh, this will print out the predicted name, uh, the predicted label name, and then in parentheses, the true label name. Uh, and I'm going to turn the axes off just for a better display. And uh, once we've once we've printed out four images using this loop, we can just break uh, this loop is really just so we get a different sampling of images every time we run this cell. So let's see if this works. Oh, I did something wrong. I just typed something wrong. Uh, labels. Thank you. Okay. So um, it's probably pretty clear that our model is not doing great. Uh, so it thinks everything is a pullover. Um, I suspect that's because I may have made a mistake up here. I think, uh, I actually think that this might've been, this optimizer dot zero grad may go down here. Let's just try that. The other thing is that if you all ran this, if any of you are following along, you may have found a very different uh, answer when you, ran, when you trained your model. 
So in general, when I've run this, uh, um, this uh, notebook, um, it usually gets something like uh, two thirds of the, the images right at the end. Um, but that said, oh boy. Hmm. Well, now we're getting uh, some other error. Oh yeah. So what did I do? Oh, I know what I did. I didn't. Uh, I didn't create a new model. <laughs> so uh, if you if you train on the same model twice, you'll often get really weird results. Let's try this one more time and see if it if it gets us better results. Did anyone uh, anyone who's following along have their model work? Oh boy. Okay, I'm not sure what I did in that recent edit. I must have I must have changed something I didn't intend to. Um, try putting this back and running it one more time. Oh, I uh, I see the problem. Um, the problem had nothing to do with all that other stuff. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're using pred here, and that's the wrong uh, the wrong value, I think. So what we want to be doing. Yeah. I uh, so I I did a, I made a very obvious mistake here. Um, this pred is something I defined earlier in the notebook. I didn't actually define it here. Um, what, I, what I forgot to put here was pred equals model of x. So we want to get the prediction from our model for this particular input or this image. That's why we're getting such weird answers. OK, this looks a lot better. So here we have our four images. Um, first, we have uh, what's clearly a pair of trousers and another pair of trousers. Um, and the model correctly labels those. However, for these, it's not doing so well. Um, it thinks this is trousers. And I can kind of see why it might think that. Uh, it thinks this is also trousers. So it seems to think everything's trousers. <laughs> there we go. These aren't all trousers. <laughs> um, so we can see there that it's, you know, obviously this is not a perfect model, but we, we trained it for all of about 30 seconds. So uh, I'm not very surprised by that. But um, it's also obviously not doing horribly either. Um, here we got about 3 quarters of the the image is correct in this particular example. Um, so it's, it's sort of working. Uh, but again, you know, we, we made a very simple model with a very simple data set. We trained it for a very small amount of time with a random starting point that really had nothing to do with anything. It was just a randomized starting point for the neural network. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of the reason that people like to do transfer learning, if you've heard of transfer learning, it's where you train a network a whole bunch on something, and then you take that pre-trained model and you bring it to a new data set and train it just a little bit on that new data set. The reason for that is because then you don't have a random start point. You have a start point that kind of already makes sense for images, maybe, or for a certain kind of image. Um, anyway, uh, this uh, and we're right on time here. So this does conclude the, uh, the demo I had planned. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of this or to uh, if people want to hear about convolutional neural networks a little bit, I'd be happy to talk about that in the review session or in a breakout session or just a little bit uh, now if people want to come up to the podium. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, thanks everyone for joining. And um, uh, yeah, I think that concludes for today and we'll uh, see everyone tomorrow.